Good morning. Let's worship together this morning and ask you to stand as we sing about the great faithfulness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
as we come before you this morning. Thank you for allowing us to come into this place. Thank you for the love that you shared and give to us, the love that we can share with one another. And as we gather together, we come together to worship together and to encourage one another, even as we see the day approaching. So thank you for this opportunity, this time, to meet in this place to worship the Most Holy One. So right now we put everything else aside and we give ourselves fully to you in worship and praise this morning. For you are our good, good father. We worship and praise your name. It's through your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.
prepared to come around the Lord's table this morning. Stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence. resurrected and he lives again and so we come to the table now of remembrance the table to celebrate 
what our Lord and Savior did for us. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, as we approach your table this morning, would you invite each one of us to examine ourselves so we might partake of the bread and the cup in a worthy manner just as your word has instructed us thank you so much for the gift of love that you gave to us through your son Jesus Christ As always, it's, it's my great privilege to bring you God's Word today. This morning, we come to our last message in our study of the book of Ephesians. Now, for the, the last four months, Paul has been teaching us about something he calls the worthy walk. Paul says, unlike the worldly walk, the worthy walk requires uniqueness. It requires unity. It requires wisdom. It requires obedience. It requires tenacity. It requires faithfulness. And Paul says it also requires this, this keen self-awareness that we're in a war against an enemy we can't see. And so contrary to what the world believes about Christianity, the Christian life is anything but passive. Yes, God is our strength. And as King Jehoshaphat said in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, the battle is not ours but God's. Yes, both those things are true, but at the same time, even though the strength is his, and even though the battle is his, Paul says that we as Christians are called to diligence, we're called to vigilance, we're called to self-discipline, we're called, Paul says, to fight the good fight of faith. And in the text we've been studying in Ephesians 6 for the last three weeks, Paul says that since this is a supernatural war we're fighting, we're going to need to arm ourselves with supernatural protection. And so in verse 11, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. And then he goes on to describe for us the six spiritual pieces that make up this supernatural armor of God. They are the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Now, we've already examined the first four. Those sermons are available to you online. And this morning, we're going to finish up with the last two. So if you would... Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. This is be verses 13 through 17. 
Before we get started, though, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we're just so grateful for this church and for this church family and just the opportunity to, to gather as a family and, and hear your word spoken. Lord, my, my prayer as it is every single week is that your spirit is here, that he fills this church, that he, that he fills me so I preach in, in a way that's accurate, in a way that brings you honor and glory, and that he is with every single person here today, every single person listening online, so when they hear your word and they leave this building, they can share it with other people and apply it to their lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's begin with the, with the fifth piece of divine armor Paul's been telling us about, something he calls the, the helmet of salvation. You know, history tells us that all Roman soldiers wore helmets. And just like we saw a few weeks ago how Roman breastplates evolved over time, so too did Roman helmets. The most primitive ones looked kind of like those old-time leather football helmets. They were fashioned out of this thick, tough leather. But in the heat of battle, they really didn't provide any protection whatsoever against swords and axes and arrows. And so out of necessity, Roman helmets kept evolving until eventually they were constructed out of that same molded metal as their breastplates were. And so once again, here we have Paul. He's imprisoned and he's, he's chained to a Roman soldier who is decked out in, in full battle regalia. And so Paul, drawing on this same battle metaphor, and with his pen in hand, he writes, and take with you the sword of the Spirit. Now, exactly what does Paul mean when he says that? Well, I thought it would be best to, to look first at what he can't mean. He can't mean you better go out and get saved, and then kind of kind of just wear salvation like a helmet, as some people claim. Why not? Why couldn't that be true? Well, because the people that Paul was addressing in this letter were Christians just like us. They were already saved. And so Paul couldn't possibly be saying to them or to us, you need to go out and get saved. We already are. They already were. And, and so if Paul's not saying that, what is he saying? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know just a little bit about the salvation process. And since that topic is a whole series of sermons in itself, I'm just going to give you the Reader's Digest version today, all right? Theologians will tell you that there are three basic phases in the salvation process. One's past, one's present, one's future. The first phase is a churchy word called justification. That's past. You believed in Jesus, you repented of your sins, you confessed Christ, and in that instant, you were saved from the penalty of your sins. Christ took the penalty of your sins for you. And whether that was 30 years ago or 30 minutes ago, it happened. It's done. It's finished. That's called justification. You were justified before God because of what Christ did for you on the cross. The second phase of salvation is something called sanctification. That's present. That's present, meaning it's ongoing. As you live out your Christian life, you're continually being washed in the blood of Jesus. You sin, you confess it, you repent from it, and it's gone. Like Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, right? The third phase of salvation is something called glorification. Only that hasn't happened yet. It's future. One day the Lord's going to come back. The dead in Christ are going to rise. And we're going to meet Christ in the sky. And we will be glorified. All right, so stay with me. So justification saves you from the penalty of sin. That's past. Sanctification saves you from the power of sin. That's present and it's ongoing. And glorification saves you from the presence of sin. That's future. Jesus is coming back. He's taking us home to live with him forever in the presence of a perfectly holy God. Got that? You look like you do. You look like you're still with me. Well, you see, it's, in, it's with these three phases of salvation in mind and the eternal confidence that they should instill in us that Paul says, in all circumstances, take the helmet of salvation. Paul says, as we run this marathon race called life, as we fight the good fight of faith, we need to run and we need to fight with the confidence of a person who knows that the race and the war have already been won. We need to live our lives like people who truly believe that through Christ, we've already been justified, that in Christ we're continuously being sanctified and that with Christ one day when the spiritual war is finally over here on earth 
hallelujah will be glorified. Amen? You see, Paul knows if we live our lives as people with a Romans 831 confidence, one that says, I can't lose because if God is for us, who can be against us? And if we're willing to put on the helmet of salvation and walk our Christian walk confident in the power of God and in the promises of God and in Christ's victory on the cross, Paul knows that not only will we approach the battle differently and our ministries differently, Paul knows that we're going to approach our lives differently. And so Paul says, in all circumstances, in all circumstances, put on the helmet of salvation, which is yours in Jesus Christ. Just a life-changing truth. All right, there's one more piece of armor Paul wants us to see that makes this full armor of God complete. Paul says, in all circumstances, take with you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, I, I, have, to, I have to wonder if any of us really grasp the power we hold in our hands when we pick up this book. In fact, I'm quite certain that we don't, or we never put it down. This isn't some self-help book. This book was written by God himself. Speaking, speaking to the authorship of the Bible, theologian John Wesley said this, and I quote, he said, when considering the authorship of the Bible, there are only five possibilities. There are only five possibilities. It was either written by good men, or by bad men, or by good angels, or by bad angels, or it was written by God. And then Wesley says, but bad men and bad angels wouldn't have written this book because the Bible condemns bad men and bad angels. And good men and good angels couldn't have written it because if they truly were good, they wouldn't deceive us, deceive us by lying as to its authority, which claims that God wrote it. And so Wesley concludes the Bible must have been written by God just as it claims. And so in our text today, the Apostle Paul says, in all circumstances, take with you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Please take, please take note as we finish up this, this study of the armor of God that none of the other pieces of this divine armor, the belt, the breastplate, the shield, the shoes, the helmet, none of them are weapons. None of them, only the sword. The implication being that this book that we all have in our possession, this sword, as Paul calls it, must be much more powerful than any of us realize. Here's the thing, though. It's not enough just to own a sword, is it? I mean, in order to effectively wield a physical sword in battle, you have to know how to use it. Well, in much the same way, in order for us to effectively wield the sword of the Spirit to protect ourselves in spiritual battles, we have to know how to use it, right? Makes sense. Now, a minute ago, we heard John Wesley say that we should believe that the Bible is what it claims to be. And, and so I got to ask you, do you know what the Bible claims to be? Do you know? And, and I only ask because in order to learn how to use it, you really need to know the answer to that question. So I thought it was worth investing a minute or two looking at what the Bible claims to be. Well, the first and foremost, this book claims to be divine. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God wrote it? Do you believe that when I'm up here preaching from the Bible that these are God's words and not mine? You should because my, my words are clumsy. My words are imperfect. My words are human. God's words are graceful. God's words are holy. God's words are divine. And to effectively use this book in your life, you have to believe that. Not, not just up here. That's just head knowledge. But in here, you have to, you have to know that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21 says, says it like this. He says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Listen, the only, the only reason in the world that this book means anything at all is because, as Paul says, they are breathed out by God. No other book on this planet can make that claim and substantiate it. Not the Koran, not the Hindu Vedas, not the Book of Mormon, only the Bible. And because that's true, secondly, Paul claims the Bible is infallible and inerrant. 
infallible and inerrant. And by infallible, it means it's true in all that it affirms. And by inerrant, it means it's true in every single, single thing it says. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says it best. He says, it says, every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. Not just some words, not just certain words, but every single word written in this book proves true. In other words, this book is flawless. It is without error. And because it is, the Bible is also complete. The Bible is also complete, meaning there are no amendments. There are no sequels. There's not a Bible 2.0 coming out in 2021. It's finished. It's complete. That's why John closes the book of Revelation by saying this. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Guys, this book I'm holding in my hand is complete in every possible way. You can't add to it and you can't take from it. The next thing the Bible claims to be is all sufficient in all things. It is all sufficient in all things, meaning we don't need anything else. It's all in here. Psalm 19, 7 says that God's word makes the simple mind wise. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy 3, 15 says that God's word is sufficient to make a man wise unto salvation. And then in the very next verse, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This book is all you're ever going to need to walk the worthy walk that we've been talking about. It is all sufficient. You know what else it is? It's all powerful. Folks, this book has the power to change lives. It has the power to change people. It has the power to change you and to accomplish God's purposes in your life. You know, I, I think that sometimes in our zeal to learn about God, we, for, we forget somehow that this book isn't just about information. It's about transformation. The words in this book literally have the power to transform us. Thing is, we can't just casually read them. We've got to study them, right? We've got to meditate on them and pray about them. This is what God says in Joshua 1.8. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. But this book ha has got to be more than just an afterthought for us. God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, said this. He said, the word that goes out from my mouth shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent. Look, if I, if I didn't believe that this book is all that it claims to be, if I didn't believe with every fiber of my being it was divine and infallible and inerrant and complete and all-sufficient and all-powerful to change lives and to transform people... Believe me, I would not be up here preaching it. I don't even like standing in front of people talking. I'm up here preaching because this book is what it says it is. Because I do, I also believe that the Bible is determinant. It's determinant. And some preachers won't preach that nowadays. By that, I mean what a person does with this book, what you do with this book is going to determine your eternal destiny. And because I believe that, I, I've committed my life to teaching people about it. Listen to what Jesus says. This is Jesus' words in John 8, 32. He says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus says the truth in this book will set you free, but free from what? Free from what? Well, well free from shame, for one. Free from remorse. Free from regret. Free from sin but ultimately free from God's judgment, right? Which means whatever you decide to do with this book, whatever you decide to do with Jesus, will ultimately determine where you're going to spend e eternity. Because Jesus is this book. The book is God's word, and Jesus is God's word. Speaking about Christ, this is what John says in John 1. This is the very first verse of John. It says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This book was written by God. It is God's revelation of himself. 
And like I said, there is no book in the universe that can make that claim and back it up. Only the Bible can. It's divine, it's infallible and inerrant, it's complete, it's all-sufficient, and it's all-powerful. And you know what? That's what makes it such a formidable weapon, which segues us right back into Ephesians 6, 17, where Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, up to this point, the armor Paul's been describing for us has been all defensive. But now we come to the last piece of armor, and it's both defensive and offensive. Let me show you how. In the Greek, there are two commonly used words for the sword. And it's important here. First, there's rumphaya. And a rumphaya was the sword you're probably picturing in your mind. It's this very long two-edged sword. So long, in fact, it had to be wielded with two hands. And this word rumphaya is only used in two books of the, of the New Testament. It's used in Revelation, and it's used in the book of Luke. Just two quick examples. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16... John writes, in his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. He uses the word rumphaya, this four and a half foot long, very heavy double-edged sword. The other place it's used is in Luke chapter 2. This is verse 35. I know most of you know the story. It's that very familiar, very poignant scene where Mary and Joseph take the, the baby Jesus to the temple for purification. And Simeon takes the beautiful Christ child in his arm, and he blesses him. It's just this, this beautiful picture of the Christ child. But then Simeon turns to Mary and he says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword, Ramphaya, and the sword will pierce through your own soul also. And it was a heavy double-edged sword that pierced Mary's soul, wasn't it? On one hand, such an incredible joy that she was the mother of the Christ, and yet on the other hand, such incredible anguish that he had to die on a cross. It truly was a rumphaya. See, though, that's not the word Paul uses in our text today. No, here Paul uses the word mahira. Mahira. And a mahira was a much smaller, much lighter sword, which most men in Paul's day carry kind of like we do a sidearm in a sheath on their side. Do you remember in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus and, and Peter pulls out the sword and he cuts off the Roman soldier's ear? Well, in describing that scene, Paul uses the word mahira. Now, of course, when Paul says it in our text today, take with you the sword of the Spirit, of course he's not talking about a natural, physical sword forged on a human anvil. No, what Paul is talking about is a supernatural, spiritual sword forged on God's very heart. I'll say it again. The Bible in your life is not just a book. It is a weapon. In fact, it's a weapon so powerful, it can bring truth into error. It can bring joy into sadness. It can bring light into darkness. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 says, this book is so powerful that it can take a heart of stone and it can change that heart into a heart of flesh. And so now here in our text today, Paul drawing on, drawing on the same battle imagery we've seen throughout our study, he calls this book the sword of the spirit. And if you've ever seen anybody use a sword, then you know that a sword is used as much to block a blow as it is to inflict one, which means that the sword Paul's talking about is both a defensive and an offensive weapon. Either way, though, folks, you got to know how to use it, right? Right? Stay with me for, for three more minutes because I want to show you something really neat, really important here. You see at the end of verse 17 where Paul says, take with you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? Well, most times in the New Testament, whenever you see that phrase, the Word of God, they use the Greek word logos, logos. And, and it does mean the Word of God, but it means the Word of God in a broad general sense, like, like this is the Word of God that I'm holding in my hand. And it's important to know that Paul does not use that word here. No, instead, Paul uses the word rhema, rhema. And the word rhema isn't talking about God's word in a broad, general sense. It's talking about God's word in a very specific sense, which means when Paul uses the phrase, phrase sword of the spirit, he's not just speaking generally about God's word. If he was speaking generally about God's word, he would have used the word logos, but he doesn't. He uses the word rhema which means a very specific statement of God. 
And so what Paul's saying here is to effectively defend yourself against a specific temptation from the devil, you have to know what God specifically says about how to deal with that particular temptation. Let me just show you one great example of this divine principle from a piece of scripture we talked about last week in the fourth chapter of Matthew. If you recall, last Sunday we saw how Satan came after our Lord three times in the wilderness. Most of you know the story. He came at him with three very specific temptations. And all three times, Jesus rebuffed Satan with the sword of the Spirit. Three times, Jesus defeated Satan by quoting specific scripture. Let me show you. First temptation, Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy 8.3. Very specific. Second temptation, Jesus said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Third temptation, Jesus says, For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Folks, that's 1 Samuel 7, 3. Three very specific temptations, three very specific passages of Scripture to combat them with. Well, in our text today, Paul says that we need to be able to defend ourselves the exact same way. Do you know how we all win the spiritual battles in our life? Just like Jesus did. With the sword of the Spirit. By knowing this book. Here's the exciting part. Like I said, not only is this sword a defensive weapon, it's also an offensive weapon. Which means not only can we use this sword to defend ourselves against the enemy, but we can actually go on the offensive and wield this sword through Satan's earthly kingdom. How? By sharing the gospel with people. Hebrews 4.12 says it like this. It says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See that word discerning there? It's the Greek word krinos. And it, it, it's a legal term. It means to reach a judgment by sifting through the evidence. And so what the writer of uh, Hebrew is saying is that when you go out into the world... And you wield the sword of the Spirit by sharing the gospel with somebody. That not you, but God's word will go work in that person's heart. And that sword, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will sift through the evidence of that person's broken life. And it will weigh that evidence against the authority of God's word. And in the process, it will show them the reality of their own sinfulness. That's how we all came to Christ. Acts 2.37 describes it like this. Luke says that after the people heard Peter preach the gospel at Pentecost, they were cut to the heart by what they heard. Folks, that's Crino. Peter wasn't a holy man. He was a fisherman. Just an ordinary fisherman. But when he wielded the sword of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit took over, and the people saw their sinfulness, and they cried out, What shall we do? What shall we do? It? And what did Peter tell them? He told them the exact same thing we should tell people when they respond positively to the gospel. He told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Folks, this, this book was never meant to be just some book that collects dust on our nightstand all week. No, God wrote this book so we could use it as a powerful weapon in our life, both defensively and offensively. Keep in mind, though, just because you own a Bible doesn't mean you have a sword. In fact, you can own a warehouse full of Bibles and not have a single sword. Because if you don't know what's in it or how to use it, it is just a book. If you want to know how to use this weapon, just look at Jesus. He gave us the pattern to follow. When Jesus faced temptation in his life, like every single one of us does, the first thing Jesus said was, what does God say I should do about it? That's how we're to approach temptation. That's how we're to approach our ministries. That's how we're to approach life. I want to close this morning with an illustration from a 19th century evangelist named H.P. Barker. H.P. Barker. After spending a summer afternoon sitting in an arboretum full of plants and flowers, this is what Barker wrote. He said, I saw three things in that beautiful garden. First, I saw a butterfly. The butterfly would flutter from one flower to another, touching as many lovely blossoms as it could, but it derived absolutely no benefit from it. As I watched a little longer from my bench, Barker writes, there came along a botanist with a big notebook under his arm and a great big magnifying glass in his hand. He leaned over a certain flower for a really long time, 
just to observe it. Then he jotted down some random notes, closed his notebook, stuck it under his arm, and he just walked away. But, Barker said, the third thing I saw was a bee. Just a tiny little bee. But when this bee would land on a blossom, it would sink way down deep into the flower. And it would extract all the pollen that it could carry. Barker said, it went in empty every time, but it always came out full. And then Barker concluded by saying, so it is with people who approach the Bible. There are spiritual butterflies who just flutter from this lovely sermon to lovely sermon, from class to class, from ministry to ministry, fluttering here, fluttering there, bringing in nothing and taking away nothing. Then there are spiritual botanists who take copious amounts of notes, trying to make sure that all the facts are correct, but they don't have the capacity to draw anything out of the flowers. It's all academic. But, Barker said, then there are the spiritual bees, people who will draw out of every precious flower all that there is to produce the honey that makes life so sweet. Can I ask you this morning, which are you? Which are you? Because the truth is, you can come to Cornerstone and you can just be a butterfly. You can flit from ministry to ministry, from sermon to sermon, from class to fl class, flutter in your wings, but never get anything out of it. Or you can come here and be a spiritual botanist who takes enough notes to fill a small warehouse. But it's all head knowledge. It's all head knowledge. Or you can be a spiritual bee who comes here to Cornerstone empty and leaves here full. Turning every truth that you're left with into the honey that makes the Christian life so sweet. Which are you going to be? It's up to you. Let's pray together. Father, we're so, so grateful for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the greatness of your word and, and the purity of it. The, the power of it. Lord, we ask that you'd continue to draw into our church family people who need to hear the truth people who need to come under its transforming power. Father, bring those who are outside the kingdom so they might be saved. And bring those who are inside the kingdom, believers who are out there in the middle of the great battle, but they're ill-equipped because they don't know your word. They don't understand your word. Let them come here empty. But let them leave here full, full of your life-changing truths. Pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen.
will sing no other name God, you will forever reign. You reign on high. And you reign down on us, your grace and your mercy. Your Holy Spirit that reigns down. Your Son who gave us life. To the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one, who we worship and who we praise. Thank you for, again, for allowing us to be together, to worship you through prayer, through the singing of your, these words, through the hearing of your word, shield that we're to put on, our sword. Father, pierce us. May your Holy Spirit convict us unto better works for you, for your kingdom, not only here in Redwood Falls and the surrounding communities, that we might make a difference throughout the world. Through the monies we give to support missionaries, staying in touch with people we know who are in other countries spread around the United States sharing the good news of Jesus Christ again Father thank you and as we leave this place may your peace and your mercy go with us it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all God's people said Amen. I want to just highlight just a couple, three things here for you before you leave. The um, Cornerstone Cares shirts, if you ordered and have not picked yours up yet, or if you have gotten your shirts and maybe haven't had the opportunity to pay for them. The same love that set the captives free.
Call